Okay, should we make a start? Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks to you all for coming. I know there's an awful lot else going on this week, so I really appreciate that you're making the time to come. My name is Marianne Stevenson. I'm the director of the UK Women's Budget Group. Um, we are a, an independent network which is made up of, of academics, um, women's voluntary organisations, trade unions, and other policy experts. And what we do is we analyze the impact of economic policy on different groups of women and men um, and develop policy proposals that will promote a gender equal economy. Um, and we're here today to um, discuss gender equalities at work, learning lessons from the past for the present. Um, Fawcett, uh, the Fawcett Society uh, said last week that Equal Pay Day um, which is the day of the year when women effectively, on average, stop earning relatively to, relative to men because the gender pay gap falls on the 18th of November. So we're holding this event just, just before that date um, in order to discuss the particular issues around equal pay in the workplace. And what we're going to do um, is to start off by hearing some of the initial findings from an excellent project which the Women's Budget Group has been involved with um, in a sort of advisory capacity which is an interdisciplinary collaboration between researchers at Edinburgh University, University College London, and the University of the West of England, looking at 50 years of work-related um, equality legislation. So we hear, we're gonna hear from Francis Galt, who's a research fellow on the project, and Professor Hazel Connolly, Professor of Human Resource Management, and they're going to present some of the findings from the project. So that's kind of looking back um, over the past 50 years. After that, um, Hannah Abid, our research and policy officer, is going to give us an overview of the current situation on equal pay and the gender pay gap. Um, and then we're going to hear from Felicia Willow, interim CEO at the Fawcett Society, about strategies we can use to address issues around workplace gender inequality. Um, then I will, I've got a couple of questions for the panelists and then we will open up to questions for the audience. Um, if you've got questions, please put them in the chat and we'll try and answer as many of them as possible at the end. Um, and links to all the organisations, projects and reports mentioned uh, during this webinar will also be put in the chat. Um, and we're recording this webinar so it will be available online if you want to come back to it later. So to kick off, it's my great pleasure to um, hand over to Hazel Connolly, who's gonna talk about the economic and political context of the Equal Pay Act um, between 1964 and 1970, and Francis Galt, who's going to talk about trade unions and the industrial relations context of this work. Um, so, Hazel and Francis, I know you're going to do a double act. I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Marianne. Um, and firstly, I'd like to thank uh, the Women's Budget Group and Forces Society for inviting us to present our research from the Gender Equality at 50 project today. Um, as Marianne has already said, the um, Gender Equality at 50 project is um, an AHRC funded project that examines uh, equality legislation from 1964 to the present. Um, it, it's a collaboration between the University of Edinburgh, University College London and UWE Bristol, and it's an interdisciplinary project drawing on feminist perspectives from history, industrial relations, politics and law. Um, we take a four nations approach, um, tracking the different implementation and legislative frameworks in England, Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales. And we also take an intersectional approach, um, recognising that the experiences of discrimination and inequality are not the same for all women. So um, today I'd like to um, uh, uh, present some of our initial findings from the years surrounding the implementation of the Equal Pay Act 1970, which we believe has important questions for women's continuing fight for equal pay in the current context. Um, uh, if you could just move on the slide, please. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to look at the economic and political context of equal pay. Um, for, between 1964 and, uh, and 1970, and Francis will carry on by looking at the trade union industrial relations context. Unfortunately, I seem to have lost my notes now with the full screen presentation, so I'm not sure how to get back to being able to see the notes. You press escape in the top left hand corner. Ah, right, thanks. Yeah, <laughs> brilliant. 
great when you've got this technical know-how on hand. <laughs> um, so uh, if you could move on to slide two, Francis. Um, next yeah. slide. Right, so the economic context surrounding the introduction of equal pay legislation was dominated by uh, worries about inflation, uh, with pay restraint linked to productivity and, and the key mechanism to try and keep inflation as low as possible was um, pay restraint uh, linked to productivity. All of these three, three things had a particular impact on the introduction of equal pay legislation because the gap between men and women's pay was so large that the increases required to achieve pay equality were considered to be inflationary and were outside the limits on pay uh, on the pay increases that the government had imposed. Um, and the only way around these limits uh, uh, was to increase pay, uh, was to accompany it with increases in productivity. Um, productivity is a, a rather vague concept and it's important to note that it is and was particularly gendered. So many of the equal pay cases that were fought in the decades since the Equal Pay Act were largely created by productivity bonuses that were given to men and not women. For example, in the cases that compared refuse collectors and school meals caterers. It's worth noting that after a long absence, um, issues of inflation and productivity have so recently been making a comeback in political, um, in political debate. So it's really important for us to remember and understand how these concepts have historically been used against equal pay. In terms of the political context, um, one of the most important catalysts for the implementation of the Equal Pay Act was a change of political responsibility from Ray Gunter, who was the Minister of Labour in the period covering the initial discussions in 1964, to Barbara Castle, who followed him as Secretary of State for Employment in 1968. In the period between 1964 and 1968, under Ray Gunter's ministry, the discussions about equal pay were largely kicked into the long gap grass of discussions between the CBI and the TUC, who could not agree on what form equal pay should take and whether equal pay could actually be achieved within the pay restraints limits imposed by the government. And also, um, uh, uh, rather embarrassingly for them, worries about the what impact women's equal pay would actually have on men's pay, particularly low paid men. Um, it's, it, it's really important to note that within six months of taking office um, uh, as the Secretary Straight for Employment, um, Barbara Castle had actually um, tabled the Equal Pay Act to be introduced in 1970, albeit with um, an implementation period of five years. And I think the important lesson that we can draw from that brief analysis of the political context is that it's really important that political will for equal pay at the, at the most senior levels has always been a very power factor, powerful factor in its violence. Francis, who will tell you more about the trade unions and, women act, uh, and women's activists' use of the legislation in the early years following its implementation. Thanks, Francis. Hazel, um, during the 70s, there was an intensification of women-led disputes across all four nations of the UK, particularly in the five years from the passing of the Equal Pay Act in 1970 and its implementation on the 29th of December 1975. Between 1972 and 1979, roughly 43% of women-led industrial disputes were for equal pay. I've been working on a timeline of these disputes to consider whether and how trade unions and women union activists have engaged with, with the Equal Pay Act in this time period. And today I will offer some preliminary observations from this research. Um, firstly, the trade union response to the introduction of workplace equality legislation reflected the wider trade union movement's attitudes towards the state intervention in employment during the 1970s which was characterised by voluntarism, preferring to pursue change through collective bargaining rather than employment legislation. 
Skepticism over the ability of workplace equality legislation to bring about social change was also expressed in some sections of the women's liberation movement, which again emphasised the importance of women's collective action over legislation. However, trade unions used equality, uh, equal pay legislation in two key ways during this period. Firstly, trade unions used the Equal Pay Act alongside the Counter Inflation Act of 1973 to demand incremental moves towards equal pay during the five year implementation period. For instance, the Association of Professional, Executive, Clerical, and Computer Staff demanded that the difference between men's and women's rates be reduced by one third in line with the legislation during a 10 week strike at GCE Salford Electrical Instruments in Greater Manchester in 1973. Secondly, unions used the legislation to actively pursue equal pay campaigns in the 1970s, particularly the clerical unions, the technical, uh, including the technical administrative and supervisory section, whose support for equal pay campaigns has been attributed to the activity of its national women's officer, Judith Hunt. Hunt aimed to highlight the inadequacies of the equal pay legislation through, through these disputes. In the special issue on equal pay, the socialist feminist magazine Women's Voice reported on an equal pay campaign in the 1976 in Scotland by the Glasgow Division of the Tr Technical Administrative and Supervisory Section. Commenting that they took the demand for equal pay seriously, they looked around the Glasgow district for the factories where women's pay was poor and gave official back into the action of the women themselves. Between January and May 1976, there were four successful equal pay campaigns in and around Glasgow, with one factory eliminating the women's grade altogether. During the five-year implementation period, women workers also resisted employers attempts to circumvent legislation through grading and redeployment. The month-long strike at the Dunlop factory in Coventry in 1972 opposed moves to regrade women's uh, jobs to lower, a lower paid category than men's, while women workers in the electronics production unit of GEC Coventry fought redeployment to other factories, which would result in a wage cut of £4 a week in a six week long strike in 1974. Elsewhere, women strikers and their union bypassed mechanisms established by the equality legislation. In 1976, uh, the Treacle uh, dispute, Britain's longest equal pay strike, uh, uh, in the strike, women's strikers and the Malcolm Union of Engineering Workers boycotted the Industrial Tribunal because, as, as one striker, Sally Groves, explained, the Equal Pay Act was so riddled with loopholes, the equal pay cases coming in front of the Industrial Tribunal in the first six months had resulted in ludicrous decisions. It was a lawyer's paradise, not an employer's paradise. Um, and that's from an oral history interview for the TUC Britain at Work project. Uh, whilst, the, whilst the support of the AUE's, um, AUEW even, uh, Southall District Committee enabled trickle, stri trickle strikers to challenge the law, Strikers at the Electrolux factory in Luton pursued equal pay through an industrial tribunal due to the lack of support they received from the union. At Electrolux, the seven women named on the case were awarded the male right, whilst the other women remained on the lower women's right, showcasing the acts of limitations. Equal pay disputes in the 1970s saw women adopt new strategies. For instance, during the 1970s Leeds clothing workers' strike, uh, women used flying pickets to call other factories out on strike. While well, strikers at Salford Electrical Instruments, Haywood in Lancashire, uh, occupied their factory in 1974, following the success of other occupations, such as the 1972 upper Clyde shipbuilders working and the occupation of the Sexton's shoe factory in Fakenham. On the other hand, intersectional demands in women led disputes were obscured by the characterization of disputes about um, either gender or race by the media academic literature and trade union events. For instance, strikes at imperial typewriters in Calamus Components, both in Leicester, were, were and have continued to be presented in a gender neutral way. And this is something that is discussed in um, Ashley Christopherson's uh, blog on the project website, if you're interested in, in sort of reading more on, about that. Uh, the Equal Pay Act was a catalyst for women's industrial militancy as a legitimized women's demand yeah. for equal pay, particularly among manufacturing office and ancillary workers who were excluded by earlier campaigns for equal pay in the professions. During the 1970s, 
women workers pursued equal pay through collective bargaining and industrial action, whereas trade unions increasingly resorted to pursuing mass equal pay cases through litigation in the 1980s. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Francis and Hazel. That's really, really fascinating. And there's, there's lots more um, information on, on the website, which I've just um, put the link to in the chat. Um, so we're now going to move on to the current situation. Um, and I'm going to ask um, Hannah Abid, who's the research and pol one of our research and policy officers at the Women's Budget Group, to give us an analysis of the current situation. Um, and just to say, Hannah's going to be talking about a paper which we're actually publishing tomorrow. So it will be online tomorrow. So she's giving you a, a sneak preview of, of some of those findings. Over to you, Hannah. Thank you, Marianne. I'll just wait for Tafisa to share her screen. So. OK, brilliant. Thank you. Um, that will load up whilst I talk, I'm sure. Um, so hi, everyone. Um, it's great to be here at this brilliant event. Um, I've already learned so much. Uh, thank you to Georgia for organising and to Tafiza for supporting with the tech. So like Marianne just said, um, I've been writing a briefing on the gender pay gap in the UK uh, as part of the work that I do on our local data project. Um, the briefing will be released tomorrow, um, along with a set of how-to documents so that the briefing can be reproduced but using data from the local level. So if you're interested in looking at the gender pay gap in your local area, uh, keep an eye out for that. I think Georgia shared the link in the chat. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so when we talk about the gender pay gap, what we're looking at, what the definition, sorry, of the gender pay gap is just one way of measuring the position of women in the labour market in comparison to men. Um, equal pay definitely comes into it, but it's about a lot more than just equal pay. Um, it's made up of a number of things. So we're talking about several factors that come together to reduce the earning capacity of women across their lifetimes. Uh, these factors are pay discrimination, um, the unequal division of unpaid care work, gender stereotyping, which leads to sectoral and occupational segregation. And this is about where you find women working. So when we talk about sectoral segregation, we're looking at uh, the industries that you find women um, typically working in. Uh, and occupational segregation is about the, the levels at which you find women working within the same organization. So usually the higher up in the ranks you go, the less women you find working. Um, it's also about the part-time pay penalty and the motherhood penalty. Uh, next slide, please. So all of these factors are uh, underpinned by the undervaluing of women's work um, and the demands on women's unpaid time versus the demands on men's unpaid time. So there's a straight line that can be drawn from the assumption that women have inherent natural skills that aren't learned, but uh, they're born with, um, to the undervaluing of their time um, and to all of the factors that make up the gender pay gap. Next slide, please. So how the gender pay gap is calculated, um, it's calculated by measuring the difference between what men and women are paid per hour on average across all jobs in the UK. So currently, um, when we look at all employees, so this is full-time and part-time employees, uh, the gender pay gap in the UK is at 15.4%. Um, so that's men being paid 15.4% more uh, per hour than women on average. So that means for every £100 that men are paid, women are paid £84.60. When we look at full-time employees, full-time working men are being paid 7.9% more than women, um, which means that for every £100 that full-time working men are paid, women are paid £92.10. Next slide, please. So, I don't know how, you, how well you can see it, but generally the gender pay gap is on a downward trend. Um, and has been since 1997. So there's not really a new story here. We all know that it's there. It gets a little smaller every year, more or less. Um, but that's why it can only do so much as a measure of women's position in the economy in comparison to men. It's important, but it's only one way of looking at things. Um, next slide, please. 
So to go back, um, as you can see, the gender pay gap is almost twice as high for all employees than for full-time employees. And this is because women tend to fill more part-time jobs. So 37% of working women work part-time and that's compared with 13% of working men. Um, women make up 72% of all part-time workers and part-time jobs are on average paid at a lower rate per hour than full-time jobs. So part-time employees are paid 60, 10 pounds, 65 pence per hour, whilst full-time employees are paid on average 15 pounds and 59 pence per hour. So this part-time pay penalty is one of the biggest contributors to the gender pay gap. Um, the reasons for this tend to be because jobs that are available on a part-time basis tend to be regarded as lower skilled um, and more common to work in sectors like retail, accommodation and food services, as well as health and social care related jobs. And these are industries where you'll typically find more women working than men. Uh, next slide, please. We also have an ethnicity pay gap in the UK. So as well as the gender pay gap, women from minoritized backgrounds often have to contend with the ethnicity pay gap as well. So across the UK, workers who are classified by the ONS as BAME, so Black and Asian minority ethnic workers, were paid on average 2.3% less than their white British counterparts in 2019. So this pay gap looks smaller than the gender pay gap initially, but it actually very ma varies massively across regions. So in London, with the city with more ethnic diversity than many other places in the country, the ethnicity pay gap reached 23%. So there's huge variation depending on where in the country you look. Now the gender pay gap exists across nearly all ethnic groups. So women who are from minoritized groups often occupy an even more disadvantaged position in the economy than the average British woman, although this is very much dependent on their specific ethnicity. So I know there's been a lot of talk um, in the last year or so about the use of the word BAME. It's been uh, the, the acronym. It's been heavily debated and criticised for collapsing all non-white people into one homogenous group with a very diverse set of experiences. So when it comes to pay, um, this is something that comes through as well, because as a group, uh, BAME women were paid on average more than white women in 2019. But within this group, there are huge variations. So Chinese women were paid 20.8% more per hour than white women, but Pakistani women were paid 9.9% less than white women per hour. So white and, and also white and black Caribbean women were paid 13.4% less than white women. So these variations show you that pay discrimination can only begin to tell a part of the story. And what we're looking at here is structural inequality. And only by looking at things through an intersectional lens, um, so in this case, we're looking at gender and ethnicity, can we begin to see how different factors come together to produce significant material differences between the lives of different groups of women? Next slide, please. Thank you. So to recap, women who work part-time jobs were paid less per hour, and they also work fewer hours. So this combination of working fewer hours in jobs that pay less per hour is why women are much more likely than men to be living in poverty. So instead of looking at the gender pay gap, another measure of women's position in the economy versus men's is to look at the gender earnings gap. So this is a measure of how much women actually take home in a week in comparison to men. It's not just about how much they're paid per hour, but also heavily dependent on how many hours women work in a week. So when we compare these figures, we can see that on average, men in the UK who work full time take home 12.1% more than women. And across all employees, so full time and part time workers, women take home 28.2% less than men on average every week. So that means that overall, for every 100 pounds that men take home in a week, women are taking home 71 pounds and 80 pence. So these gaps are larger than the gender pay gap, and they're a really important way to show us why women are much more likely than men to be living in poverty, particularly in households where women are the sole adult 
like single mothers or single pensioners. Uh, next slide, please. So um, I've briefly painted a bleak picture of the current situation. Um, and when I was writing the briefing on the gender pay gap, I was quite depressed. But I'm going to end with um, what we could do differently to narrow both the pay gap and the earnings gap between men and women in the UK faster. So the first thing, um, part-time jobs need to be equally as equally valued as full-time jobs. That means being better paid and have genuine opportunities for career progression. Um, this would be beneficial for everyone because it would contribute to a better balance of work, personal and family life. And it would also mean that men would be more likely to take it up and have more time to spend caring for their children and relatives, as well as contributing more to the equal sharing of household responsibilities. So this would contribute to eliminating one of the biggest contributors of gender inequality, which is the unequal division of care work. The second thing is that fully flexible working arrangements need to become the norm wherever possible to accommodate people with caring responsibilities and health needs. Um, it's not only mothers with childcare responsibilities who would benefit, but also people who have health conditions, which mean that they can work, but they can't manage full-time hours. So the TUC published a report on the disability pay gap in 2019, which showed that part-time work is one of the is also one of the main contributing factors to the disability pay gap, because a higher proportion of disabled people than non-disabled people work part-time. And one of the things that we learned during the pandemic is that many jobs can be done from home, and this offers huge accessibility benefits for disabled people, as well as people balancing care and responsibilities. The third thing. Uh, is shared parental leave. Shared parental leave is a key pillar of laying down the foundations for equality in the home and in the workplace because it sets the pattern for who's responsible for the unpaid care of a child. Um, having a system of genuinely shared parental leave which incentivizes fathers or second parents to take parental leave would guarantee a shift in cultural norms around parenting infants and allow fathers and second parents uh, valuable time with their children. Not to mention, if this were to become the norm, I bet you would see workplaces implement those fully flexible working arrangements much quicker. Um, the final thing, the Women's Budget Group advocates for a universal pre-childcare system with well-paid and highly qualified staff. So modeling of the employment and the fiscal impacts of such a system showed us that whilst the upfront investment is significant, almost all of it is recouped through higher tax revenue, through increased maternal employment and reduced spending on means tested benefits. Um, next slide, please. Those are just my contact details um, and our website where you can find the briefing that we'll release tomorrow. Um, thank you for listening and I look forward to answering your questions in the Q&A portion of the event. Thank you very much Hannah, that was brilliant, thank you. I'm sorry I disappeared halfway through that, I don't know what happened, I suddenly got thrown off the group and then I was back in again, so there you go. Um, so I can now hand over to our final speaker, um, Felicia Willow, who is the Interim CEO at the Fawcett Society, um, who as we all know does a huge amount of work on um, the pay gap and equal pay. Um, and she's going to talk about the strategies that we can use to promote uh, gender equality in the workplace. So over to you, Felicia. Thank you, Marianne. And um, thanks, Hannah. I thought that was a really clear summary. I think there are definitely some journalists and politicians out there who should get your briefing about mm -hmm. what the gender pay gap is and what could go about kind of addressing some of it. Because if you read some certain newspapers articles, they really deliberately misunderstand and it can be quite frustrating. Um, I think it is a really frustrating time at the moment when it comes to these kind of issues. Um, you know, I do feel really discouraged at times. It feels like we don't have that political will. Um, Hazel talked about that at the beginning about how important this high level political will is to make this stuff happen. It doesn't feel like there's interest about this right now. We saw gender pay gap reporting completely suspended during COVID right at the point where we really needed to know what was happening to women. We then saw when it was back in this year, there were some rumors going around it might be canceled, but in the end we got a six month extension on reporting. Again, this stuff is not stuff for when things are good, when things are fine. They're actually gender equality is something that should be a priority every single day and especially when there's a crisis going on um you know so we 
we are in a situation where I think, you know, obviously Fawcett does a lot of campaigning, a lot of lobbying around these kind of things. And we will continue to do that. You know, some of the things that we're asking the government for is we want to see gender pay gap reporting reduced down to employees, employers of 100 employees. Uh, we want to see mandatory action plans. Um, we want to see meaningful enforcement of those employers who don't report. Uh, as Hannah was talking about, we want to see an overhaul of shared parental leave. So there's actually a protected period of leave for each parent that's adequately resourced. Um, and we also want to see a review of childcare. You know, there's all this little bits and pieces put into childcare. Actually, the amount that the UK invests in childcare is pretty pathetic and it's not reflecting of the kind of economy that we have. And, you know, there are so many economic reasons for it. So those are, those are things we're still fighting for. But I think we've also got to be, um, you know, recognise that this is not a time when we're getting a lot of progress at this national level. There isn't the political will and we have to keep fighting. We have to keep demonstrating why this is so important but at the same time I think we also have to look to employers directly and all of us have a voice at some level with some employers somehow that might be as a customer it might be as an employee it might be as somebody that you know running businesses and I think that that's a lot of the work we've been doing at Fawcett over the past year has actually been about engaging directly with employers because of course we all know that gender equality is really good for business um, you know, there's a there's an often quoted statistic that McKinsey produced that we would have 150 billion increased um, revenue, you know, GDP year on year if we had gender equality in business. It is a good thing for businesses to do. We've got to get employers to understand that. And we've got to get employers to take some of the really simple steps forward to make gender equality better in their workplaces. So I have a list of a few things that they can do, which I will run through. Um, the first thing is to always show the salary when you advertise a role. There is a campaign in the charity sector. I think it's like hashtag show the salary. Um, salary secrecy undermines the right for, for equal pay. It's a theme that I'll kind of come back to in a few of these. You know, four in 10 women aren't even aware that they have the right to equal pay for the same, uh, same work. Um, and 60% of women in workplaces across the UK either don't know what their male colleagues earn or believe they're earning less than men doing the same job. So show the salary when you advertise a role, you should be able to know what it is that you're gonna pay this person to do the job. And the second thing, um, which is is related, is about stop asking for salary history in all stages in the recruitment and application appointment process. Fawcett's actually doing a big campaign at the moment called End Salary History. We're doing this around Equal Pay Day and we're asking employers to pledge to stop asking for salary history or if they've stopped already to commit to not doing it ever again. It is hugely unfair. It perpetuates both gender and ethnicity pay gaps and tells you nothing. We've actually got some interesting statistics coming out in a couple of weeks about how completely useless it is, but some employers like to say it helps them benchmark. There are professional bodies around to help you benchmark your salaries. So you don't need to ask the people applying what it is that they, they've been paid previously. It tells you nothing about a person's skills or abilities. It just helps you discriminate against them. So let's end that. Um, another thing employers can do is establish defined pay bands across the organization. So make it really, really clear. clear be transparent, be accountable, what it is that expected at each level. And that should go across different parts of your organization. So earlier on, we were hearing about, you know, um, uh, kind of the way that we see women clustered in certain parts of the organization. We've seen equal pay cases, such as in uh, supermarkets, where the warehouse staff are not being paid equally with the retail staff. And we see warehouse staff tending to be male, retail staff tending to be female, and guess who gets paid more? Um, so if you have these defined pay transparency bands, you, you understand what it is that you're going to get paid at each level. Also practicing pay transparency, something that is culturally very uncomfortable in the UK, but something that actually has a huge power. If people know their salary ranges and they know what other people are roughly getting paid, then they can understand um, and challenge inequality in the workplace. Um, pay transparency actually has lots of really positive impacts on the relationship between employers and employees. If people think they're not getting paid enough for the job that they're doing, they're actually much more likely to be less productive and be looking for work elsewhere. So you might think as an employer that things are you know, okay, because you're getting away with it, but actually it's going to have an impact on your productivity, which is not good for business. Um, obviously, participating in transparent and accountable gender pay gap reporting is something we would also like to see all employers do. Obviously, at the moment, it's only required for those who are at 250 employees or larger. But of course, there's nothing to stop um, smaller organisations getting involved. Um, there was an interesting piece of work done by King's College London in the last uh, month or two that actually compared the different approaches to gender pay gap reporting across a number of different countries. And I think in one country, um, they went all the way down to 10 staff. So, you know, we're talking about reducing it to 100. It is possible to do it in smaller organizations, although it, you know, it does change slightly how they do it. Um, but, it, you know, reports need to be honest and frank and transparent and accountable. And I think when you read some of the gender pay gap reports that are out there for different businesses, they are none of those things. So really pushing employers to do that properly is really important. 
Another thing we recommend, which might still seem unrelated, but of course, when we're talking about intersectional feminism, it's not, is it to implement ethnicity pay gap reporting as well. There is a whole separate campaign going on this at the moment, um, but it is something that organisations should be keeping an eye on. It's not as simple as gender pay gap reporting, but there are ways to do it and there are people out there who can help. And of course, when we see you know, ethnicity and gender intersect, um, it is a problem um, and, and we need to pay attention to it. I think also seeing employers actually invest time and energy in understanding why they have the gender pay gaps that they have is really important. You see a lot of gender pay gap reports that are making excuses, whereas actually what is the problem in this organisation? Not just what is your gender pay gap, but what is the problem? What is driving this? Is it about not having enough women in leadership? Is it about having different pay rates for different groups of staff? Are you not attracting women into your workforce? You know, really understanding those things and taking action to deal with them um, is something we'd like to see. And then the next thing is about having a culture that encourages parents to take parental leave. So a supportive and comprehensive approach to parents. So that might be, you know, things like maternity leave, paternity leave, private pumping areas for breastfeeding, flexible working, you know, all of those different things and making sure that you have a culture in which any parent feels comfortable and secure in, in getting that leave, asking for changes to their work um, arrangements, those kind of things to make that fairer, because that will have an impact on, um, on addressing inequality in the workplace as well. Um, we also encourage everybody to take steps to recognize the value and skills in all the roles, so especially when we see these kind of, these generalized attitudes towards groups of staff members, and this idea that certain groups aren't worth as much as other groups, really understanding that these sexist attitudes are often um, behind them, behind these undervaluing of staff. Um, so ensuring that you recognize the value and skill in, in the roles also helps employers to, to not increase their G GPG. Um, and finally, you know, one of the things we, we really want to make mandatory, but employers should be doing this anyway, is having an annual gender pay gap action plan, something that is constructive, something that is specific, something that is, you know, smart targets. We're all told that we have to do them in the workplace. Let's do them when it comes to the gender pay gap. Um, really seeing what it is that you're going to do each year, what employers should do each year. And I think all of us can lobby employers that we know to do this, um, to ask them to say, you know, you've got this gender pay gap. What are you going to do about it? Meaningfully, taking it seriously, having it accountable. So all of those things are things that can be done. And I think that at a time like this, when it is really discouraging, just finding the practical actions, the, the power that we all have, the power in our voice, the power of the people we know, you know, wherever it might be and doing whatever we can to push that forward um, is, is what I would recommend. So that's it from me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Felicia. That was great. Um, and thank you to all our speakers. Um, I think everyone will agree that we've been taken on a real journey from, from the, the struggles for um, equal pay from the 1960s onwards to the fact that we still have a problem today to what do we need to do in the future. Um, so we're going to open up to questions uh, in a second. Um, if you've got a question, please do put it in the Q&A box um, and then we will try and get through as many as we can. Um, but I've got a, a couple here. First off, I just wanted to ask um, Hazel and Francis, I know that you've been looking at lots of different stories of, of individual um, strikes and, and other um, industrial disputes. And I was wondering if there was anything that you found particularly interesting, you know, if there's a particular story that you didn't get a chance to go to in any detail that you'd like to tell us about. I don't know, Francis or Hazel, which one of you wants to do that? Um, yeah, I, um, well, the, the stories that uh, really fascinated me were um, in relation to, as I say, the, the, the dominance in the 1960s around pay restraint and um, the, the impact that that had on the fight for equal pay uh, because it meant that women, um, well, just the concept of equal pay was considered to be too costly. And we could see the same in relation to um, pay freezes in the public sector, which are now the only places that the government can really control, have any um, pay con uh, constraint. And we could see that the massive impacts that pay freezes in the public sector have had on women's pay generally, because of course women uh, predominate in the public sector. So any, every time we have a pay freeze in the public sector, it, it will increase the, the gender pay gap and it will increase um, uh, pay inequality. We also didn't touch much in our presentation on the Ford women's dispute, which I know is often linked to the, um, uh, the development of equal pay legislation. And we've done, we have done quite a lot of research on that. And um, 
while the, the Ford women's dispute was undoubtedly very influential in that the women got invited to famously have tea with um, Barbara Castle, history has kind of um, embellished this to say that the, um, the women were encouraged back to work with the promise of equal pay legislation. And actually that wasn't the case. What the women were promised was a court of inquiry, which actually um, sided with the employers and in fact chastised Ford for giving the women any pay increase at all because they think that the women, um, when their women's work was not um, as equal to men's. So actually what happened in those discussions didn't help the Ford women at all. And I think it's worth noting that the Ford women uh, were underpaid by 15% um, of the men that they wanted to compare themselves with. And 50, 51 years later, we still have a gender pay gap of 15%. So we really do need to ask ourselves just how far have we actually come from those days. Thanks, Hazel. Francis, I don't know if you've got anything you want to add to that. Uh, I can add from, from sort of my own uh, research on, on, on the industrial disputes timeline that um, there was an interest in sort of resistance as well among trade unions. So you get examples of, um, of strikes against, against equal pay in some places, particularly in 1970 uh, when it's first introduced, when the act is first introduced. And you get instances of, of sort of activists breaking breaking um, trade unions all crossing picket lines, uh, so, so sort of undermining women's strike action. So that's something I didn't quite touch upon in, in my presentation, but it's another interesting trend to come out in the sort of this um, perhaps contradictory and ambivalent position of, the tra of trade unions, where they are incredibly supportive in some instances and act as uh, uh, as opposition and, and others, so this very diverse uh, experience of, of of this sort of relationship with women and trade unions. Thank you. Um, I'm I've seen we're getting quite a few questions come in, and I don't want to abuse my position as chair, so I'm going to take those questions um, from from the audience, um, and I'm going to take them in groups of three, so that people, because different people can answer different bits. Um, the first one was about figures for um, non-British white women workers as a comparison. Um, and I think um, that's actually been answered in the chat, hasn't it? Um, so hopefully that's been dealt with. But yes, we do. Um, and uh, there is there is data there um, in the annual survey of hours and earnings. Um, the second question, how do you challenge an employer who asks for salaries on their application forms? Because not putting it there probably means you won't get shortlisted. Um, and there's a question, do you know the disability pay gap at present in the UK? Um, and then, um, while I agree very much with the factors that have been outlined, to what extent do you think women's other caring responsibilities are a factor? So, for example, should pair, paid carers leave be part of the policy mix we're calling for? So those are three questions. I'm not going to suggest that everybody answers all of them because we want to get through as many questions as possible. So um, I will start with Felicia um, and then do Hannah and then Hazel and Francis. So in answer to the first one, um, yes. it is always a risk not to provide an answer to something in the application form. But I would suggest um, pointing the, the employer in the direction of um, things like the resources. So on the employer, on the end salary history website, there are resources for both employees and for employers. Um, and, the, and the employees one, I think in both of them, there are some stats about what it is that salary history does. I don't think most employers go about this with a, you know, a malevolent intention necessarily. They might be trying to use it for negotiating salaries, et cetera, but actually to understand the impact it has. So I think if you come back and say, actually, I'm not comfortable sharing this, um, you check out this website for more information, that should be sufficient. You might find they actually get more scared and put you through because you're challenging something about equality. But I mean, I, I have personally done that. I have refused to provide salary history. This is years, years before Fawcett, um, partly because I took a couple of jobs that, um, that were in different countries and, and really did affect what it looked like I was getting paid. And so I got to the point where I said, I'm not, I'm not going to share this anymore. And it was never a thing. Nobody ever really raised it, but it is always a risk. And I guess the other thing is saying, do you want to work for an organization that has a problem with somebody raising equality issues like that? Because it might not actually be, I mean, that might be a privilege to not have to go for a job like that. But um, if you have that privilege, then it might be something to think about as well. 
Thank you. Um, Hannah, do you want to ask the question, answer the question about the disability pay gap? Uh, yep, yeah. so the TUC published a report last year about the disability pay gap in 2019. Um, and in that report, they reported that non-disabled workers, uh, so this is in 2019, earned £1.65 uh, more per hour than disabled workers, and they calculated this to be 15.5%. Um, and then in 2020, this increased to 19.6%. Um, and within this group, disabled women face the largest pay gap. So the pay gap for disabled women is nearly nine percentage points higher than the pay gap for women overall. Um, both groups of women are paid less than disabled and non-disabled men, um, with non-disabled men being paid 36% more than disabled women. I'm going to put that in the chat because it's quite hard to follow figures, I know, um, when you're listening to them, but yeah. Okay, thank you. And then um, there's a question about um, other caring responsibilities, so paid carers leave as well as, as um, maternity, paternity and parental leave. Does anybody want to come back on that question? What was the question, sorry, Marianne, I missed it. Uh, the question um, was, um, I very much agree with the factors that have been outlined, but to what extent do you think women's other caring responsibilities, so people have been primarily focusing on childcare, but for example, um, uh, caring for older people. Um, so should paid carers leave be part of the policy mix that we're, we're calling for? Um, I I'm, I'm can answer very briefly, but yes, yes definitely. Um, we refer to childcare a lot because there is just so much data on um, maternal employment and women struggling to get back into the workplace um, and having to cut down their hours, but um, paid care leave and looking after other people who are not children, so elderly relatives, um, is definitely part of the problem and like a not no recognition of unpaid caring responsibilities of women. So that's a big yes. Um, but they, these debates also feed a lot into what we do around social care and what the state's responsibility is for funding care for older people as well. Um, because at the moment, women take on the disproportionate impact of that gap in social care funding. Great. Um, I've got a question here that I think would be good for Hazel and Francis, um, which is, can the panel say something about um, equal pay for work of equal value rather than equal pay for the same work and why that matters now and historically? Yep, I can answer that question, Marianne. Of course, the first Equal Pay Act only introduced the concept of equal pay for same work. It was some years later, around about 1983-84, when we actually got the concept of equal value, which meant that women could compare themselves to men that were um, uh, doing broadly similar work or uh, work of equal value. So they didn't have to be doing the same work. It just had to be evaluated the same using a job evaluation scheme. Um, and uh, that made all the difference because the vast majority of cases, like the supermarket cases that um, Felicia uh, talked about, uh, earlier, they are, are actually comparing men and women in the same organisation, but not doing the same work. Um, and, equal, and, and interestingly enough, um, uh, the uh, Ford women's dispute in, in 1968 was, was an equal value claim, which is why they didn't get equal pay until 1984, after fighting for it since 1968. Um, uh, and, and a close examination of what happened in the Ford women's dispute showed just how problematic the concept of job evaluation was for those women and how badly the job evaluation scheme was actually um, uh, uh, was actually Im implemented in the Ford dispute. Um, I don't really want to go into a lot of detail about it here. It's, it's quite technical and complex, but just to say that actually um, we're still facing those problems of equal value and how you um, how how you can um, show equal value using a job evaluation scheme, which is still a very blunt instrument all of these years later. Thank you. Um, so I have another question here. The gender pay gap uh, calculation ignores um, privatised or stroke outsourced women workers generally in low paid jobs and reduces the gender pay gap calculation. So presumably this would be specifically in um, public sector bodies where actually a lot of the lowest paid jobs have been outsourced. Shouldn't employers have to include their outsourced workforces in gender pay gap calculations? 
Um, any thoughts on that? Um, I'm, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure the gender pay gap calculations come from the annual survey of hours and earnings, which, yeah, it comes from the ONS. So it's about the, it's not about what employers report that would be gender. No, I think, I think, I think so. actually what was meant here is the mm -hmm. um, monitoring of the um, pay gap within individual workplaces. Okay. Um, um, so the the calculations that individual employers do about their pay gap within their within their um, workplace. So, for example, if you're a public sector employer, should you be required to include those workers who've actually been contracted out and are no longer directly working for a local authority, for example, which will often be the lowest paid workers? Well, in an ideal world, uh, Marianne, of course, yes, we would say that. And I mean, exactly the same problem exists for the equal pay legislation, because, of course, you can only compare yourself with somebody who's in the same employment. And one of the ways that employers have often got around equal pay legislation is to contract out some of the work so that the lowest paid work so that there isn't um, a risk of an, uh, uh, of an equal pay uh, claim in their organisation. So these are um, loopholes in the legislation that do really stand in the way of women um, uh, exercising their legal rights. Has there been any case taken against, you know, some of the large um, outsourcing companies, the kind of Centrica and all of those companies that actually do employ large numbers of workers delivering all a huge range of different services for public bodies. Has there been an equal pay claim taken against any of those? Not that I know of, but the, the, the latest ruling in relation to one of the supermarket cases, and I might not have got the legal detail quite right in this, but the fact that um, uh, uh, the, 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 the ruling, which actually is under European law, because that mm -hmm. case was first taken under European law, so it can continue under European Court of Justice, was to broaden out the concept of when women can compare themselves. So they don't have to be working in the same establishment. They just have to be working for an employer who could make the change make the difference so has control over the two sets of pay rates and that was probably a really um, a big step forward in relation to trying to close that loophole but of course um, we're not in Europe anymore so the influence of the European Court of Justice will have an impact on future equal pay cases going forward. Okay. Thank you. That's really helpful. I've got one last question, um, which is uh, both Anna and Felicia spoke about the importance of childcare. Some participants in the Gender Equalities at Work project who've been involved in women's movements since the 1960s and 70s feel that is this issue has not necessarily been historically prioritised by women's organisations in the UK as compared with other countries. Um, and I wonder if panellists from women's organisations would offer their perspective on this. Um, Felicia, I'll come to you first and then. Anna, um, I can't really speak about it before because I've only been at Fawcett for a year um, and uh, while I'm across some feminism stuff before then I can't speak confidently about the past but I do think that Covid has highlighted hugely the impact that childcare has had or the lack of childcare had on women because when obviously schools closed it was mothers who bore the brunt of all of that time so I don't know if that's had an impact on thrusting it into the forefront but certainly something that is a big priority for Fawcett is something we're quite closely involved in we're about to, to do a new project um, that we're looking specifically into childcare questions we also worked on a joint um, survey that was done recently with um, like Pregnant and Screwed and Mums Net was Women's Budget Group involved yes, in that as we well were. yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, and that that came out with some really interesting interesting things that, that got a bit of media attention which is always good things like about a third of, of parents spend more on childcare than they do on their mortgage which just seems kind of gobsmacking um so yeah it it, it definitely is a priority and it is something that I think we can't deny is, is hugely important to equality in the workplace. Obviously, what we'd like to see is, I think what I used to think when I first had children was that childcare was for both parents, um, certainly how I see it with my family. Uh, but I realised that when you look societally, that's not how it works. So it is really very important. Yeah. I mean, I'd certainly say I can't, I can't speak back to the um, activism of the 60s and 70s, but when I was at Fawcett in the 
kind of mid 90s onwards we were working on childcare as one of the things that we were we were talking and campaigning about um hannah i don't know if you've got anything to add on um, that yes similarly i can't really speak about the past but certainly since i've been at the women's budget group which has been almost two years now we've worked extensively on childcare um and pushed very much for universal like childcare provision year round on a full time basis um, and we have the economic modelling and costings to go with these demands. So um, we, I think there's a big, a huge recognition that child, a uh, fully flexible and accessible childcare is very much a huge part of closing the gender pay gap. I don't know, Hazel or Francis, have you got any um, sort of historical overview on this, on this question about is this something, is childcare been an issue that historically hasn't been prioritised by the UK women's movement? Um, we've focused largely looking at the equal pay issue rather than um, uh, um, the, those broader issues. Um, so we, we haven't we haven't looked at that yet. Um, I think uh, Francis has done quite a lot of work on the relationship between uh, the women's movement uh, and um, and. Uh, women's activism more broadly. I don't know whether, Francis, you want to say anything about that relationship? Uh, yeah, um, so I've looked at it sort of from a, a trade union perspective, um, sort of across from the, the 60s uh, to the present day. It's not sort of, childcare wasn't the focus of my research, but it's a theme that repeatedly uh, comes up. And it's something that women um, in trade unions are, are campaigning on sort of uh, very consistently. So a lot of the things that are discussed today are very, fam uh, and we've discussed uh, in this event, are very familiar with stuff that I read about in the 70s uh, and things, which is obviously, um, to some extent, uh, d disappointing that, that to see sort of, uh, that things haven't changed much. Um, but yeah, it, it's something that sort of is, um, is patchily, supported so you know a lot of, when i looked at childcare campaigns uh, in the british film and television industries it's really pushed from individual women at workplace level um and a lot of the problems are around working patterns so the film and television industry um particularly today but even in the the sort of 70s and 80s it's, it's based on a, a freelance industry where you really need a solid childcare from the state because you're change an employer so often so you might be working a week with one person and, and a week with the next and and so you, you don't have that consistency in employment but need that consistency sort of at state and local level uh, so there so there was this um these challenges that arise because of the nature of, of the work that they're doing and then it's not being a priority sort of on, on the trade union agenda either so there's this difficulty in pushing pushing through for childcare um, because they're not getting sort of the, the wider support, but there are some key key campaigns sort of in the BBC and stuff, which which were successful and did um, did get sort of uh, workplace unions, uh, workplace uh, childcare facilities set up. Thank you. I was just thinking what you were saying about these issues, you know, going back through time and the same issues coming up. I remember um, years ago when I was at Fawcett, we did a, a cartoon exhibition, and one of the cartoons was from the 1950s. I think it was 1953 and it was titled A Vision of the Future and it was a group of women with placards um, uh, saying equal pay, uh, speaking to this male minister behind a desk saying, um, you know, uh, ladies, the government agrees in principle, but the time is not yet right. Um, and it was it was titled A Vision of the Future 1983 question mark. So this was women in the 1950s talking about how we're still going to be fighting about this in 30 years time. And um, more than 30 years later, um, we are still talking about it. So, however, um, there is some really positive signs of movement. The Fawcett Society is, is doing its campaigns and I would urge everyone to support um, the, the campaigns about not, um, uh, not asking for previous salaries. And um, I guess for this year, there'll be a lot of act activism around um, Equal Pay Day on the 18th of November. We have our new report coming out um, tomorrow, which we will be heavily publicising. There will be ongoing um, research coming out from um, Hazel and Francis and all the team that they are working with. And hopefully we can hear more about that as, as more of that comes up. So it's one minute past three o'clock. 
I'd like to thank all of our speakers, um, Hazel, Francis, Hannah and Felicia. Thank Georgia for organising this and thank to Fiza, who, as always, has managed the tech brilliantly. Um, so everything has run really smoothly. And thank you to all the participants for taking part. Um, I hope you agree with me. It was a really fascinating um, overview, um, sort of from the past to the present and looking forward to what we need to see in the future. Thank you very much. Bye bye.